Well, right, I'm going to try and share my screen so that you can see my notes. Let's see. Give me some thumbs up if this works, which hopefully will. Uh, that's nearly working. That should be should be my notes. Okay, thumbs up. Thank you very much. Excellent. You have a little clock down here to make sure I don't run over time as well. Um, so what are we looking at right now? Um, we're looking at a series um, called Leading Ladies, uh, which focuses on the leading characters, female characters within the Bible and the contributions they make and the characteristics they have. Um, it's revealed a lot more to me than I imagined we would. What, why are we looking at that? From my own perspective, uh, it was just a, a secular trip, really. I was picked up a copy of the National Geographic magazine from uh, 2019, so a couple of years ago now. And uh, it was an issue devoted entirely to uh, women, simply because here in the United States, uh, women earned the right to vote in 1919. So they were celebrating the 100th anniversary of the woman's right to vote, suffrage it's called. Um, and so the, the, the issue of the magazine had 100% contributions, both literary and photographic, entirely from female contributors. And one quote that stood out uh, said, we need to elevate uh, female voices and stories. For too long, we've been seeing the world primarily through men's eyes. Now you might argue, look, that's not a very spiritual perspective. That's just a human argument. But I think it actually carries over into the spiritual world very well as, as well. We're in a community which tends to hear mainly from male voices. Be that right or wrong, that's the, that's the fact of the matter. And therefore, I think we suffer that shortfall as well. Unfortunately, as a man, I can't bring a game-changing uh, uh, perspective to that because I see the world too through male eyes, whatever that might mean. But at least what I could do, I felt, was actually uh, focus my attentions very deliberately on the leading ladies, as it were, of scripture and see what we can learn from there. And it, it turns out we can learn a great deal. And I made a number of surprise, uh, surprising discoveries um, even myself having read the Bible, as you have, for many years. So let's make a start. <clears throat> Jephthah's daughter's story. Um, Judges 11, we just read most of it. It's a problem passage for many, mainly because later in the scriptures, in the, in the list of the faithful, God approves of Jephthah. And a lot of people who are coming perhaps to the Bible for the first time would read that story and say, how could you possibly approve of a man who did that? He appears to have sacrificed his daughter by fire. And even if he hasn't, he's done something you know, terrible to her. Uh, why is this something we should approve of? And how is this relevant to today's society? These are the questions then that I think uh, the, the passage throws up. Is Jephthah participating in human sacrifice? I mean, there's a question that's been kicking around for quite a while. Uh, we find it detestable perhaps to, to, to think about, but you, know, you have to read what's there. Is it there or is it not? I hope we can lay that uh, question irrevocably to rest today. And even if he is, how can Jephthah be acceptable to God? We might want to ask, well, even if he isn't, if this isn't about human sacrifice by fire, what actually, what actually happened to Jephthah's daughter? And equally importantly, if that's not the focus of the story, then what is? There's no point in telling a story about here's a man who didn't set fire to his daughter unless that story has some other point. So what is the point of the story? Where's God? I mean, if, if a man is planning to do something dreadful to his daughter, why doesn't God intervene? We know God doesn't always intervene, but where is God in this particular story? We're going to see his fingerprints quite clearly. Why does he seemingly not intervene? And perhaps uh, just as relevantly as any other question, there we, here, here we are in um, the 21st century, whether in the United States or South Africa or England or Wales, what are you worried about? You're worried about decaying society. You're worried about Brexit, economic pressures. You're worried about a pandemic virus. Why on earth? I mean, yes, it's a nice form of escapism to go to the Bible. Is that what the Bible is? Just to escape and think about some absolutely irrelevant world from a million years ago? That's not, is that why we're here? Why is this chapter still given to us today? Why did God preserve Judges chapter 11 all the way into the 21st century? What's the point? I think we need to... Uh, grapple with these questions very directly, and I have no fear in doing so. In fact, let me make this rather wild and, and crazy claim. I would suggest to you that if I were to say to you confidentially, just answer in your own mind, what's the biggest five ecclesial problems that you have today? 
one of those problems that you will mention will be addressed by Judges 11. It's that relevant. Let's have a look and see if we can make good on those crazy claims. First of all, the story. Jephthah, the Gileadite, uh, Jephthah's daughter's father, of course, pity we don't have her name, uh, was a mighty warrior, okay? He was the son of the region's founder, but he was defective in some way because he was born of a prostitute, so he wasn't a full son of the family. His father was a Gilead, who obviously named the region after himself in the tribe of Gad, I believe, uh, and his mother was a prostitute. He's a godly man. The verses that we didn't read here from, from 9 to 27 are his big exposition to the universe that he understands that man has no power and that if things are going to happen well for Israel, that's in God's hands. God alone will fight for Israel. So he is clearly a godly man. This is what we want to recognize, a part of everything. And he is a man commended for his faith. Here's that famous quote from uh, Hebrews 11. I don't have time, says the author, to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who did all these magnificent things. And Jephthah is mentioned among them. So something he's done is commendable to God. Here's the storyline. And, and, and what I find interesting is that those opening nine verses or 11 verses or whatever of the chapter, every single fact we're given is relevant to solving the mystery of his daughter. Gilead's wife also bore him sons. When they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You are not going to get any inheritance in our family. Why are they discussing the inheritance? Presumably, fairly obviously, Gilead himself, the father, has died, right? Gilead ruled the family and Jephthah was allowed to live there because Jephthah was Gilead's son. But the moment Gilead dies and it's time to divide up the inheritance, why then his full sons are thinking, well, we don't have to divide a portion out for this guy because he's only our half-brother. Let's kick him out. He's a, he's a defective son anyway. He's born of a prostitute. So you're the son of another woman. So they drive him out. Pretty mean stuff there. Um, Gilead's died. The inheritance is being divided. The brothers want to get rid of Jephthah. Out he goes. Sometime later, and, and Jephthah goes about a couple of days travel away to a place called Tob, and he becomes a sort of a, a warrior bandit there in order to survive. Sometime later, Israel are threatened by Ammon, uh, a neighboring uh, tribe, to, to invade. And so the elders of Gilead go to get Jephthah from the land of Tob, where he's now had this reputation of being, you know, a, a mighty warrior. And they said, come, come lead our armies and defend us. And Jephthah, perhaps understandably, perhaps, you know, hard, hard to, to judge his mind, but he's like, why should I fight for you? You kicked me out. You threw me to the wolves. I could have died in Tob. It's a lawless land. And you just threw me out. And now you're in trouble. You want me to come fight for you. Why should I do that? And notice it's some time later. And as we'll see later, Jephthah has a daughter, which we know, who's probably almost certainly about teenage age. That being the case, some time later means probably about 20 years. So 20 years-ish after Jephthah's been driven out of his family, he's still mad at them. Perhaps understandably, his life was put at risk, his inheritance was taken away. In human terms, it's reasonable that he's angry. But it's been 20 years. He's still very bitter against his brothers. This is of supreme relevance. And so he says, okay. He eventually sort of relents. He said, okay, but here's the condition. If I fight for you, and if the Lord gives us victory, because he's a godly man, he, know, he knows he's not going to be the winner of the battle. If the Lord gives us victory, then I want to be your head in Gilead. This is important. I must have this power. And the elders will say, oh, yeah, sure, whatever. You'll be our head. And Jephthah, Jephthah pushes back and says, why should I take your word for it? Will I really be your head? Come on. I want you to swear before the Lord that this is true. If I come back victorious from this battle, I'm in charge. I get to give an order that no one can refute. See, he's planning something. Right? And the elders replied, the Lord is our witness. We will certainly do as you say. And Jephthah says, not good enough. Come on, come before the Lord, which presumably is the tabernacle. Come before the Lord and swear these words in Mizpah. And so the elders of Gilead did precisely that. So Jephthah got to have supreme control over the land of Gilead if he came back victorious from battle. Jephthah's desire to have ultimate power is a detail repeated four times in the Bible. 
Now, if something's repeated four times over, the words are on the screen so you can see them, you know it's super important. So we should pay attention to that. Maybe something Jephtha isn't known for, but it needs to be. Jephtha was the man who insisted on having power if he came back victorious. He insists on total control. Now, why? The first time you hear there's a man insisting on total control, you probably don't like that guy. He's like, oh, well, he's obviously power hungry and proud and crazy. We know this is not true of Jephthah. Jephthah is a very humble and godly man, but he's insisting on, on power. Here's the evidence. These are the verses perhaps that we didn't read. All I want you to take away from this screen is those four quotes show Jephthah understands that humans achieve nothing and God grants the victory. He basically says in each of those four quotes, anything that we've ever had or ever won in battle has not been down to our strength. It's because the Lord has given it to us. So clearly, he's not a proud man. He's not a power-hungry man. And yet, against his character, for some reason, he's a humble man. So his desire for power and authority is not from pride. These four quotes show that. But he's clearly planned something that no one in Gilead will be able to resist when he comes home, because he's made them swear an oath. I get the power if I come home victorious, and I will give a ruling, and you cannot get out of it. What? This is what we need to explore. Here, <clears throat> here then, is Jephthah's um, vow. <clears throat> he says it to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's. I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Now, here's where problems abound enormously for anyone reading the Bible and trying to respect the God of the Bible. It's like, really? You are going to sacrifice as a burnt offering whoever comes out of your house? So we need to pose the question. This is a big question to get out of the way. Did Jephthah actually intend to perform or even risk human sacrifice by fire? I mean, I suppose perchance an animal could have come out of the house, but I wouldn't have thought so. I don't think that really counts. Clearly, he would have at least risked sacrificing a human this way and in fact that's what he intended <clears throat> so what is it is it that he intends let's look at um, bible quotes and see um, something very important you may not have seen this before you may ahaz sacrificed his son in the fire following the detestable ways of the nations the lord had driven out i want you to notice those three english words that i've highlighted in the fire they correspond to a little Hebrew clause just the same. It's, it's in the fire. This is the clause. This is the phrase that is detestable to God. Here's another quote. Israel sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire, provoking the Lord to anger. So when humans do this, including God's own people, God becomes angry. This is not what he wants. Another quote. God himself is speaking. They have built the high places to burn their sons in the fire. Something I did not command or mention. A nice little touch. The, the, the prophet even says, nor did it even enter my mind. And that's hyperbole, of course, because everything enters God's mind. He's able to consider everything. But God is, is, is so repulsed by the idea of human sacrifice that he says, by fire at least, that he, that he says, it didn't even enter my mind that you'd do such a crazy and disgusting thing. They built the high places to burn their sons in the fire, something I did not command or mention, nor did it even enter my mind. You do all kinds of detestable things the Lord hates, says Moses. You even burn your sons and daughters in the fire. And my point is that in all these cases, this clause is the same, and it's translated into the same three English words. Let no one says the law explicitly, sacrifice his son or daughter in the fire. Anyone who does is detestable to the Lord, which already strongly suggests anyone who sacrifices his daughter by fire isn't going to show up in Hebrews 11 because it's detestable to the Lord. Right? Now that's a suggestion, that's not a proof. We can even do better than that. But clearly, we're already learning something interesting about what Jephthah has or rather, rather hasn't done. Here then is the quote from Judges 11 we've read. Whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me, I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Notice, therefore, this clause, both in English and in Hebrew, 
this clause is different from sacrificing in the fire, right? But those five quotes above are identical Hebrew. That's what the Lord hates. Do not sacrifice in the fire. But Jephthah doesn't say that. He says, I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. That's a different thing. You might say, well, come on, you're splitting hairs. What do you think happens to a burnt offering? They don't just, you know, massage it with olive oil. You know, it does actually go up in flames. You do realize that, don't you, Pobal? It's like, yes, I know that. But the fact that it's a different clause is interesting, and it gives us grounds to explore that he's actually using this as a metaphor because he's a godly man. He already knows that sacrificing in the fire is detestable to the Lord. It's written in Deuteronomy that he will have read. Now, this is the most important verse you will meet when you, when you encounter this question. And you may not have ever gone to the prophecy of Ezekiel to solve what's happening to Jephthah's daughter. But if you haven't, you have done because here is the proof we need for what did or rather didn't happen. God is speaking via Ezekiel. When you offer your gifts, the sacrifice of your sons in the fire, same phrase, you continue to defile yourselves. Am I to let you inquire of me, O house of Israel? As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I will not let you inquire of me. Let me translate that into, I mean, look at the quote to check that I'm not cheating, but let me translate that into common English. He says, if you sacrifice your children in the fire, I will not even listen to your prayers. Am I to let you inquire of me? I will not let you inquire of me. I'm not going to listen to your prayers. Pray whatever you want. I'm not listening, says God. Okay, so if Jephthah intended to sacrifice his daughter in the fire, God has promised via Ezekiel, even though that comes later chronologically, that he would never even listen to Jephthah's prayers. That's a promise from God. What actually happened, Jephthah prayed to God, let the Lord, the judge, decide the dispute this day between the Israelites and the Ammonites. Not only did God listen and answer, but he answered favorably and gave Jephthah the spirit of the Lord. Then the spirit of the Lord itself came upon Jephthah. This is proof. There's very few things in the Bible that can be actually proved, but this is proof. God listens to Jephthah's prayer and responds favorably. So Jephthah can never have been planning to burn anyone because Ezekiel says, you plan to burn your kids, I will not listen to your prayers. He listens to Jephthah's prayer and answers it favorably. So we know what Jephthah wasn't planning. He wasn't planning to burn anyone. He didn't burn anyone. Nobody got burned. The proof is Ezekiel 20. Okay? That we can be clear about. And that's helpful. So therefore, when he says, I'm going to sacrifice it as a burnt offering, he's speaking as an idiom. We use plenty of idioms. Pigs might fly, all sorts of stupid things. We say the whole nine yards. People argue about what that means. doesn't matter. He's speaking as an idiom. What does he mean? I think this is translatable. <laughs> Let's learn from the law. If the offering is a burnt offering, he is to offer a male without defect. That's interesting. And the priest is to burn all of it on the altar. So what is signature about the burnt offering compared to the other offerings? The characteristics of a burnt offering are threefold. Number one, it's generally a free will offering. Not always, but generally it's something that someone chooses to do of themselves. So Jephthah is, is in line with this. He's saying, God hasn't commanded this of me. This is something I choose to do. If I'm victorious with the Ammonites from God's blessing, then I'm going to do this thing. And that, that's like a burnt offering. The subject had to be a male without defect. So that was clearly his plan male without defect, and the sole unique characteristic of a burnt offering was that you used the whole animal, not part of it. Every single other offering in the law was only using parts of the animal. But the burnt offering and the burnt offering alone, you gave it all. The entire animal went to God. Okay? So Jephthah planned, if it was a burnt offering he was planning, he said it was, he planned to give a male without defect to the Lord wholly or forever. That's what he's saying. He's not intending to set fire to anyone, and, and English speakers have been distracted the world over by thinking that Jephthah was going to burn anyone. We've already proven that could not be the case. So here's what he is planning, and we'll actually find Jephthah's not the only one who sacrificed a child as a burnt offering. He's the only one to use that phrase. Someone else who did exactly the same thing, her name was Hannah. 
Hannah wept much. She wanted a baby and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow saying, Lord, if only we'll look upon your servant's misery and remember her and not forget your servant, give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life from the moment he's weaned. So what is she giving? She's sacrificing Samuel as a burnt offering. She doesn't use that phrase, and therefore there hasn't been centuries of wonder over whether Hannah burned Samuel, which she did not. She, it's a free will offering, part one. It's a male without defect, as far as defect free as you can get, because he's given as a child before he's had a chance to go off the rails. And he's given wholly for life. All the days of his life will be dedicated to God, and he won't um, he won't uh, follow any other career or pursuit. So Hannah is offering her firstborn son, Samuel, for lifelong temple service. That's what she's doing. And by the same language, she's offering it as a burnt offering. So I think we can see this is what Jephthah is planning. And here's how the vow comes about. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, his only child, right? Dancing to the sound of tambourines. She was an only child. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, oh, my daughter, you have made me miserable and wretched because I've made a vow to the Lord I can't break. Stop, think. How can this have happened? It's his only child. Who else is going to come out of the house? I mean, is Jephthah just the stupidest man ever, right? He's coming home. Who does he think is going to come out of the house? The local dentist? I mean, it's not... It's going to be his child. And yet he seems surprised and amazed that this could ever have happened. So how is he surprised and amazed? What's happened? Why did he not expect his only child to come out of his house? Can you tell? Because the answer is actually on the screen. It's not his home, is it? Where does Jephthah live? He lives in Tob, right? We established that in the opening verses. He was driven out of his home, and he went to Tob. This is Mizpah. You know, we'll say, well, okay, if it's Mizpah, it's not his home, is it? The Bible's lying. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, what's his home in Mizpah if he lives in Tob? We know where Mizpah is. It's the capital of Gilead, isn't it? It's not his home. Well, it is. It's his family home. He's gone to his parents' house. I live in Capitola by the sea, Santa Cruz, California. But I might still say, I'm going home to Southampton to visit my parents. I should. It's my mother's birthday today. I must not forget. It, right. Must remember. Now I've said it publicly, I will, I'll remember. So I might still refer to going to my parents' home as going home. This is what Jephthah's doing. His daughter doesn't live there. There is no chance that she can come out of the door because she lives with him in tow. He's gone to Mizpah to get someone who lives in the family home in Mizpah. The daughter shouldn't be there. And out she comes. No wonder he's surprised. She's supposed to be two days travel away to the southwest or whatever it was. That's what's happened. It's all gone horribly wrong. Jephthah lives in tow. His family home is in Mizpah. And yet through the hand of God, his daughter is not where she should be. She should be in Tob, but she's actually with the family in Mizpah. So we know who he's after, don't we? He's after one of his brothers. He set this up entirely so that he can come home victorious from battle. And he's got the power in Gilead. No one is allowed to refuse him and say, first one out of the house, I gotcha. It's supposed to be one of his brothers. Why? Because they kicked him out of house and home and took away his inheritance 20 years ago, and he's still bitter about it. And he's going to get one of them. Home he comes. Which brother is it going to be? I don't care. Fine, send me any of them. Oh, there's my daughter. Whoops. And it's all gone horribly wrong. Why was Jephthah's daughter in Mizpah? She's supposed to be in tow, you know, in dad's house, and she's with the grandparents. Or actually, since they're dead... She's with the hated uncles. Is it a cunning plot by the brothers to discover what Jephthah was planning? Not a chance. A, Jephthah didn't tell anyone, and, and Jephthah would be enraged if he thought that his brothers had tricked him a second time. He wouldn't feel guilty. 
Maybe it was her idea to celebrate God's victory. In fact, maybe it was her idea to use this victory as a wonderful unifying force to bring the family back together. She's just a teenager. Notice one clue. You'll see the picture there. Tambourine. What does tambourine remind you of? A victory song led by a woman using a tambourine. Jephthah's a godly man. His daughters read her scriptures. Miriam the prophetess, after the crossing of the Red Sea, you remember, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women followed her with tambourines and dancing. Why? Because they celebrated Israel's defeat of the Egyptians via the hand of God. This is what Jephthah's daughter is planning. Too easy to spend all of our focus on Jephthah, isn't it? But the leading lady working behind the scenes here is Jephthah's daughter. She's trying to mend the family. She's come home. What a great surprise to come home and meet her father triumphant from battle with her father's brothers and, and sing a song in celebration of victory of this over Ammon, given by God, as her father knows. And it's all ruined because Jephthah has made this selfish, bitter vow to get one of his brothers and it ends up backfiring onto his own daughter, and he's distraught. And I think he knows. I think from the moment he sees his daughter, he knows this is the hand of God. And he knows God is saying, look, you just want to live your life in bitterness? Fine, then this is what's going to happen. Ruin. You want this? This is what you've done. It's not what I've done. This is what you've done. And Jephthah knows it. And that's why he's heartbroken. Because he's a godly man. He's just destroyed his own line. And he's destroyed his, his daughter's life. He's not going to burn her, but he's destroyed her life anyway, hasn't he? It's an excruciating irony, isn't it, to his father's, to her father's carefully plotted revenge. But let's just review the story to make sure. Check me out. Don't, don't believe anything I say, for goodness sake. But I mean, check it out with the scriptures. See if this makes sense. This is what we're saying. Jephthah was a godly man. The proof is there. He recognizes the hand of God in anything. And the fact his prayer was answered proves he was not intending human sacrifice. We know that from Ezekiel 20. God says, you burn your kids, I'm not going to listen to you. Right? Jephthah had been embittered against his brother for, quote, some time. Right? He was still mad 20 years after they threw him out of house and home. He could not let go of that grudge. He insisted on establishing total authority in Gilead. Before he went to battle, if I come back the winner, you have got to do what I say. Swear it before God. And they did. So he establishes total power over his brothers, who otherwise would have been rulers of the region, right? Gilead was the ruler of the region. It would have been the firstborn son who ruled thereafter. So the firstborn son would have been the most powerful man in Gilead. And Jephthah says, if I win this battle, I want power over that firstborn son. I want power over my brothers. Swear it. And they do. He vows to devote someone from his family home in Mizpah, not from his house in Tob, to the Lord. And he vows to offer them as a burnt offering, a male without defect. Consider how beautiful that is. Why did you throw me out of house and home anyway? Oh, because I'm a defective male. Because my mother was a prostitute. My mother wasn't actually the family mother. Oh, I'm defective. Well, aren't you pure? Oh, good. Well, the law provides for that. I can't sacrifice myself as a burnt offering because I'm not pure enough, am I? You, my brothers, are. That's why you threw me out. So it works perfectly, doesn't it, on a human scale. In bitterness, it's a perfect revenge. Jephthah plans vengeance on his brothers by sending one of them into lifelong temple service and making sure they won't have a family or whatever. And that's what happens. But it happens to his daughter. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promise. Now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends because I will never marry. And again, that makes more sense. Now, she's, she's mourning the fact she won't be able to have a family. Not that she's going to lose her life. If she's going to be killed, she'd be mourning her, her whole life. She mourned her virginity, not her death, because that's what she was going to lose, uh, her chance for a family. How old was she? Well, she's given a very mature response, as you can see from the words on the screen. And she was unmarried at, that, at this time. And in that society, you'd be married by the time of your late teens, I should imagine. So probably a teenager. So if Judges 11 isn't about human sacrifice by fire, and it's not, what is it about? And I think we've answered that question already, but I'll just spell it out to make it clear. 
It's about bearing grudges. Now, what are the top five occasional problems you have? <laughs> nobody speak. <laughs> They'll get awkward. <laughs> no, nobody say anything. But answer in your own head. And I, I tell you now, if you don't have a problem in your community with people bearing grudges from old fights from 20 years ago, 200 years ago, goodness knows what, then I'd be surprised. This is what Judges 11 is about. It's about bearing grudges and the disaster that it causes. And if that's not a relevant problem in your life, I'd be very surprised. It's an extremely relevant chapter. It's got nothing to do with setting people on fire. That's not helpful at all. That's no use to us. And Judges 11 is very useful to us, as is the story of Jephthah's beautiful daughter who had this wonderful plan to bring unity and healing. And it got trashed because a stupid father couldn't let go of a grudge. I should say stupid. I shouldn't say that, should I? He's a godly man. But he's got this one defect to bear grudges. And that one defect destroys everything. Isn't that a lesson for us? You can be as godly as you like, but one defect can bring it all crashing down. And of course, what it led to is bearing grudges, was taking revenge. That's where the disaster came from his, from his vow. And he was sort of pretending it was service to God. I'm going to send someone into lifelong table, temple service. How could God ever disapprove of that? He's going to get another servant. God will, will love that. But God sees the motive of Jephthah's doing. But you're not really interested in whether I'm, or not I get another temple servant. You're interested in the fact that, that one of your brothers will, will lose his chance to, to do anything else except that. So the lessons, number one, keep your promises. And I think this is why Jephthah gets to mention Hebrews 11. Because he kept his promise. He destroyed his daughter's life from his own foolish vow. He destroyed his own lineage. She was his only child. No more children. So, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary, says the psalmist, who may live on your holy hill, he whose walk is blameless and who keeps his oath even when it hurts. And let's not over-focus on Jephthah. It hurt his daughter, I'm sure, more than it hurt him. But the oath was kept. And I think that's why you see Jephthah showing up in Hebrews 11. Not because God approves of child sacrifice. Of course not. God approves of those who keep their promises, even when it hurts. But the lessons from this chapter also say, don't bear grudges and keep your gifts to God sincere. And on those two points, Jephthah has failed. Let's, let's wrap this up now by looking at the, the, the big pictures of the last couple of slides. Jephthah's father was a man named Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. What does that tell you? It tells you Gilead used prostitutes, even though he had a wife that was alive. So right away we see Gilead himself was a selfish, self-indulgent man. The root cause of this whole tragic sequence came from the fact that Jephthah's father, Gilead, that had had sex with a prostitute by which Jephthah was born, right? Interesting. So the father commits the sin, and Jephthah, the son, pays the price of the sin. So the father is self-indulgent, and the child essentially gets punished for it, picks up the pieces, right? Does that sound familiar? Jephthah, having not broken this cycle of abuse, falls into it himself. He makes this selfish, self-indulgent vow. I will sacrifice whoever comes out of the house of burnt offering. And his child pays the price for it. You see how those cycles are repeated. Father does something selfish, child pays the price. Father does something selfish, child pays the price. This is human rulership. This is how it works. It's not very pretty. Both leaders were both fathers. They abused their power for a personal agenda. And both times a family was broken as a result. And here's a question we threw up at the beginning, which we mustn't ignore. Where's God in all this? Well, here's, here's an interesting part of where God is. This is a strange sting in the tail to this story. Jephthah devotes his speculated teenage daughter to the Lord. And we also looked up Hannah's case. Hannah devotes her young son, Samuel, to the Lord. So Samuel gets sent to the temple as well. Now, the time between these two events is difficult to establish, and historians guess differently, but the average comes out to be about 30 years different. So Jephthah first devotes his daughter to the Lord. She's a teenager. By the time she's now in her, what, late 40s, Samuel is also devoted to the temple. They will have met. 
You see, God is actually building families that humans tear apart. Samuel grew up to respect the Lord. We know that, right? The boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with men. Well, how did Samuel grow up to respect the Lord? You might say, well, he was at the temple, you silly person. Of course he grew up to respect the Lord. I mean, Eli was there. Eli is noted as the worst father ever. That's not me being judgmental. The Bible says so, right? Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. And since you can't blame the father for the sins of the son, the Bible does explicitly say, and by the way, it was Eli's fault. It was Eli's hopeless fathering that meant his sons were wicked men. So Samuel was not raised to respect God by Eli. Has Eli failed in that respect? If that's the case, who's living at the temple to act as a godly parent to influence the infant Samuel? There is no doubt in my mind that Jephthah's daughter raised Samuel. She's in her late 40s. And you, knew, you know she spent two months lamenting her lost virginity, two months lamenting the fact she'd never be a mother. I strongly suspect, I could be wrong, that she spent a lot of her time praying for a child anyway. Look, God, I don't know how this is supposed to happen. Here I am in the temple. I'm not supposed to have a kid, but, you know, it's what I've always wanted. Please. And by the time she gets to close to 50 years old, biologically, that window of opportunity has closed. And the answer appears to be no, you can't have a child. And then, dedicated to the temple, comes along a pre made, prepackaged little boy who doesn't have a mother anymore because his mother has given him up, which is actually slightly selfish in itself, but whatever. So there's a little boy being given up by a mother, and there's a want-to-be mother in need of a little boy, and God has orchestrated all this, and it's so gentle. It's in the background. You don't see it unless you read ever so carefully. God provided a mother for the orphan boy and provided a long-awaited child for the godly leading lady, and, and what a child that she raised and how she raised him. This isn't just some guy in scripture. She raised Israel's last and greatest judge. This is an immense thing she did. But what a wonderful opportunity she was given by God and how well she responded to it. And that story is so quiet. Everyone spends all their time arguing whether Jephthah lit matches and burned people. That's not even the point. We already know that didn't happen. This is the point. The leading lady who wanted a child was ultimately blessed with a child and raised Israel's last and greatest judge thereby. And I find that beautiful. Thank you very much, Mick.